welcome to the Wigtown Book Festival and this In Conversation event with me, Danny Garavelli, and author Peter Ross. It's such a pleasure to be in an actual room with an actual live human being after all the Zoom calls. Of course, I should stress that we are appropriately socially distanced. So before we uh, get properly started, there's a few housekeeping things that I need to attend to. So there's, I've been told there are chat boxes that you can ask questions into and hopefully towards the end of the event I will be able to put some of those um, questions to Peter. There are also links on the website which tell you how you can buy the author's books directly from the Wigtown Bookshop, which is obviously a great way to support authors. And you can also donate directly to the Wigtown Festival, which is a great way to keep events like this going. Now, I'm really thrilled to be here with award-winning author and self-confessed goth, Peter <laughs> Ross. Uh, as many of you will know, Peter's first books, Donderlust and The Passion of Harry Bingo, were sparkling anthologies of reportage which captured the essence of Scotland. Now he's written another brilliant book, and here it is, A Tomb with a View, The Stories and Glories of Graveyards, and look at that gorgeous cover. Um, it's a, it's a, just a gift for people like me who are committed cemetery lovers, but also for people who just like captivating yarns beautifully told. A Tomb of the View takes the reader on a tour through Greyfriars in Edinburgh, Milltown in Belfast, and even as far as Flanders Field, but it's much more than a Taffafile's Bible. It's a meditation on life and love and loss. And it's one literary acclaim from the likes of Denise Mina. Andrew O'Hagan and Hilary Mantel, who described it as a considered and moving book on the timely subject on, uh, uh, on the timely subject of how the dead are remembered and how they go on working below the surface of our lives. And that's an endorsement most writers would give their right arms for, isn't it, Peter? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Your fascination with graveyards goes right back to when you were a little boy, doesn't it? It does. It goes right back to my childhood. And in fact, there's a bit right at the start of the book that sort of gets into all that. So I'll, I'll maybe just start by reading that, if I may, and that give would be people a flavour. I grew up in graveyards. The dead were my babysitters, my quiet companions. Not silent, though. They announced themselves with great formality. You only had to read the stones. Here lays the corpse of Mary Dickey, who died December the 18th, 1740, aged three years and nine months. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Now that's one I remember from the old town cemetery in Stirling. I'd spent whole summers there, a littlest child myself, trying to catch tadpoles, those living commas, in the small pond called the Pithy Mary, or taking a poke of penny sweets up onto the Ladies' Rock, a steep outcrop in the centre of the cemetery, where one could enjoy flying saucers and foam shrimps while looking out over the panorama of graves. Now those graves, laid out in rows, there were shelves full of stories. I was a, a shy boy, wary, watchful, living inside myself, living in books, Treasure Island, The Hound of the Baskervilles, adventures from an earlier age, and headstones in that company were just more tales. I would wander among the headstones, reading the inscriptions, gopping at the 18th century carvings, and poking a soft finger into the socket of a stone skull, or into the pits left by musket balls in the walls of the medieval church. If the imagination is a muscle, graveyards are a gym, and I would look at the names and wonder. Did John Barnes, hairdresser, who died aged 67 in January 1891, ever in his youth take comb and scissors to Ebenezer Gentleman, who died at Christmas 1868, and whose crooked stone lies just a step or two away? It never felt frightening to be surrounded by dead people. In those days, the late 70s, early 80s, the living seemed much more of a threat. The cemetery was in poor repair, lots of vandalism, and worst of all was the monument to a pair of women, Margaret McLaughlin and Margaret Wilson, put to death in Wigton in 1685 for refusing to give up their Protestant religion. They had been tied to stakes and drowned in the rising tide of the Solway Firth. Now, here in Stirling, they had suffered a second martyrdom, the glass of their memorial smashed, the heads and hands of the marble statues broken off 
and stolen. Who would do that? The sad truth is, it could have been anyone. The cemetery was haunted by ne'er-do-wells, junkies, punk dafties, solvent huffers with fairy rings of plukes around chafed lips. I lived in mortal fear of a lad known as Tommy Glowbag, who was rumoured to have inhaled so much solvent that a pouch of the stuff had mushroomed on the back of his head, pushing tight and milky through his short ginger hair. But nobody wanted to get close enough to verify this. Tommy had a reputation for recreational violence. One day, while I was playing, alo playing alone on the ladies' rock, he saw me and began cursing to climb. But his legs were rubbery beneath him, and about halfway up he became, rather appropriately for a glue sniffer, stuck. Still, it was a bad moment. I felt like Jim Hawkins in the rigging, looking down in terror as Israel hands climbed dagger and teeth towards him. That was the thing about graveyards, though. They felt like, they feel like, treasure houses of stories. Some of these stories are international bestsellers. George Eliot and George Michael in Highgate. Oscar Wilde and Jim Morrison in Pearl Lachaise. Others, though, are known only locally, if at all. And this book, like the best sort of funeral, will be a celebration, not a lament. It will uncover the stories and glories of the best graveyards, from grand city cemeteries to elegiac country churchyards. I love all these places. I love the bones of them. And I want to make you love them too. That was great, Peter. I love the idea of the dead as like not as protective forces rather than sinister forces, as, as you've captured there. And it's really then not an exaggeration to suggest that the stories and um, that, that, you, that your love of stories and your love of language stems from the old town cemetery. Then, yeah, it, absolutely, that is the case. I mean, as a little boy, I would I would wander around there and I would look at the words on the tombstones, words like unto and remembrance and evermore, and phrases like suffer little children that I mentioned there, mm -hmm. and I would try to sound those out and work out what they meant. So. I think, I, in some ways, I learned to read um, in, in cemeteries. Um, Beatles lyrics, the Bruins comic strip, and cemeteries <laughs> were really the three... Those were the kind of holy trinity of teaching me to read. And I guess my parents as well, I should give them credit. Of course. Um, but also, I think, um, as well as making me um, a reader, that was part of what made me a, a writer. Because you walk around these places, and you wonder about the stories of the people, and you wonder about the narrative of their lives and it makes you curious about character and narrative and things like that. So I definitely became a reader in cemeteries as a child, but I think possibly a writer as well. Mm -hmm. But it was another cemetery, wasn't it? A cemetery that's close to both our hearts that actually inspired the book. So how did you first come to be wandering around Cathcart? Well, I moved to um, the south of Glasgow um, maybe uh, sort of 13 years ago now, and um, I, I, where I live is really just at the, the, the Cathcart Cemetery is just at the back of my house. I can see it um, from the upstairs windows of my house. I can see the tombs. I've got a view of the tombs, if you like. And when I first moved there, I, I started walking in there, and I, I was very attracted to the place. It's a very um, it's a Victorian garden cemetery, but like a lot of those, it's become um, overgrown. So where it was once a garden, it's now now a kind of wood and all the kind of stone angels are missing bits of their wings, and there's ivy growing up them, and it's very attractive aesthetically. But one day when I was walking in there, I noticed, sort of half-hidden within a bush, um, a, a very small pink granite stone, um, and on it was written, Mark Sheridan, comedian, and it said that he died in 1918. Mm. And I'd never seen anything like that. I'd never seen the words comedian on a stone so I decided to find out a bit about who he is, who he was, and I did that first of all through Google, obviously, and then went to the the Mitchell Library in Glasgow and started reading up about the story more more generally, and it turns out that that Mark Sheridan, whose real name was was Frederick Shaw, was a music hall star from the northeast of England, and he'd, he'd made a name for himself and a career for himself in London. You can you can see photographs of him. He's a kind of amiable looking fellow with bell bottoms and a bowler hat. Um, and what's incredible to me is that, that, that he is the reason that we know the song I Do Like to Be Beside the Seaside. It's, it was the popularity of his first recording of that in 1909 
that made it become the, the kind of folk song that it has become now. Everyone knows that song. And so I was very curious about how did the person who sang that song come to be buried on the hill behind my house? And it, it turns out, very sadly, that, that Sheridan had taken his own life um, while on tour in Glasgow in 1918, apparently because um, his um, production that he was in was not doing well. But, but who, who really knows what the truth is in these sort of situations? But, but it did make me think that is an incredible story. Um, this person is, is out of place there, really, and their story has unfolded for me. And there must be stories like that in graveyards all across Britain. And so I, I set out really to find out what they were. And so that was the, the acorn of the book. Well, thank goodness for that glint of pink granite. Otherwise, <laughs> the book would never have come into being. So, I mean, obviously, you're talking about graveyards as repositories of stories. And I think you've called them libraries of the dead as well. And you've unearthed many, many more since Mark Sheridan's. <laughs> Uh, do you mind if I just throw a couple of names at you, Please. and then you can tell us about you can tell us about the individuals? Um, mm. Phoebe Hessel. So Phoebe Hessel is an incredible story. I think this is a BBC drama <laughs> waiting to happen. Someone really has to make this program. Um, Phoebe Hessel um, was um, a woman um, born in Brighton in 1713, and she actually um, died um, in 1821 at the age of 108, okay? Um, she had been born in the reign of Queen Anne and she died in the reign of George IV, right? So she lived through the reign of, of, of five monarchs. So she was really um, a, a witness to history. And her, her gravestone, which is in the, the churchyard of St Nicholas in Brighton, kind of lays that out. But the other incredible thing about her was that as a young woman, she somehow contrived to pretend to be a man and go and fight in the British Army. And there's, there's various reasons given for why that m might be. And the reason most people say is because she was in love with um, a soldier who went off to fight. And because she couldn't bear to be separated from him, she decided to um, pretend to be a guy and to go and fight in the British Army. And her, her, her story was only discovered when she was bayoneted on some <laughs> awful battlefield in Belgium somewhere. And the army doctor kind of rushing to her side to kind of dress her wound, you know, took off her top. And, you know, the game was up, yeah. really, at that point. Um, but so she, 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 she basically signed up for the army. Um, and you, she might have expected to live a very short life as a result of that. But instead of which, she's actually lived this incredibly long life. So she's a kind of Orlando figure or a Zelig figure, you know. And um, I just found her absolutely fascinating. She's just one of the the many stars of Britain's cemeteries, I think. Did you not catch a high woman as well? She did, yeah. She um, she she liked a drink, which she might have picked up in her, her in her soldiering <laughs> days. And uh, she was drinking one day. Um, this was after she'd come back from the wars and when she was in society as a, as a woman again. Um, and she was having a drink one day in an inn and she overheard a conversation between two high women about a job that they had just pulled off. And so she ended up being the star witness in the trial that actually got one of them hung. And later on, that became quite a famous case because Tennyson wrote a poem about that highwayman because there was a really horrible thing where he was hung in a gibbet and um, as his bones fell from the gibbet, his mother would kind of come along in, in the dead of night and gather them up and then go and bury them um, Cut somewhere. The individual pieces. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so she, she apparently really liked windy nights because more bones would fall. <laughs> So she's she's really touching upon all sorts of interesting stories, Phoebe Hessel. So really, the BBC need to get the finger out on that one, I think. Sure. And what about Hannah Twinoy? Well, Hannah Twinoy, um, again from the 18th century, she is um, buried in the grounds of Malmesbury Abbey. And if you look at her stone, it kind of lays out uh, the whole story about Hannah. Um, essentially, she was um, the first person in Britain or England uh, to be killed by a tiger. So she was, a, she was a barmaid at the White Lion Inn. And apparently the, the circus had sort of set up in the, the sort of back courtyard of the inn. And while the, while the circus was not, um, when the show was not on, the animals were in their cages. And as she went into the, the courtyard to fetch ale or whatever it was she was doing, it was her kind of habit to take a stick and to run it along the bars of the tiger's cage, which apparently um, the tiger didn't like very much. And she was warned... Uh, not to do this, 
but she didn't listen and she um, ran the stick along the, the, the cage. The tiger burst out and, and killed her. And it's become almost a kind of cautionary tale for children or something. It's, it's, almost, a kind of, it's almost slightly amusing in a horrible histories kind of way, but it must have been an absolute atrocity and a horror at the time. And I, I just think it's interesting the way that that's, the sort of tone of that story has changed over time. But yeah, you can go and see her, her, her headstone and the, the story's all, all laid out on there. And I guess the headstone though makes it real and makes it, you realise that she is a person that was mourned and, and, yeah. and more than just a fable, yeah. Yeah. So there's also my favourite, um, <laughs> the exotic and the macabre, uh, Marquesa Luisa Cassati. Yeah. So I, I discovered this story um, when I was um, at Brompton Cemetery in, in London. Brompton Cemetery is one of the so-called Magnificent Seven Cemeteries in London. This this kind of circle of cemeteries that, that goes around the city, Grand Cemeteries, like, of which Highgate is the most famous. But Louisa Cassati is buried at Brompton. And I was there um, on the night before um, the Pride March for um, an event called Queerly Departed, which is run by um, an organisation called Cemetery Club, who do a lot of interesting tours of, of cemeteries in London and I think elsewhere. And the idea with Queerly Departed was that they were um, going to talk about and, and take people to the graves of individuals who are now thought to have been gay or lesbian or, or bisexual, even though they might have not have been out at the time or necessarily used those words for themselves at, at the time. So it's not really about retrospectively outing people, as I understand it. It's much more about um, allowing us in the 21st century to kind of consider those people in the round as the kind of complex individuals that they were. So um, Louisa Cassati is on that tour, and I, might, I, I can't really explain her to you properly without just reading a little bit about her, so I'll just read a very okay. short passage, if that's okay. So I'll start with um, Sasha Coward, who um, is the co-creator of the tour. Thank you for coming, said Sasha Coward. What a bizarre thing to do on a Friday night. You're all weirdos. We laughed, the 50 or so of us gathered in the Anglican chapel. The drag queen, the bearded dude in the Grateful Dead tea, the teenager with a rainbow painted Aladdin Sane style across her face, me with my notebook full of graves. Weirdo is no insult. We were all, I reckon, happy to own that term. After a couple of stops by the resting places of music hall performers and the bride of Frankenstein actor Ernest Thesiger, Sheldon announced what, for me, was the highlight of the tour. The bisexual Marquesa Luisa Cassati, who puts Lady Gaga to shame, he said. Her grave may be the only understated thing about her. A small stone urn, half hidden by overgrown grass. Nevertheless, it was clear that this is a shrine of sorts. Someone had left a few lilies, wilting now. A photograph propped up showed a striking woman with intense eyes. It was taken in 1912, but it had the same steely androgynous power as Robert Maplethorpe's celebrated photograph of Patti Smith on the cover of her album, Horses. The Marchesa was a socialite, bohemian and muse, an Italian heiress who came to live in London later in life, in debt and in decline. She had been famous for her outrageous life and clothes. One outfit, created by the costume designer of the Ballet Russe in 1922, was made of electric light bulbs and came with its own generator. She swathed herself in fabulous rumours. It was whispered that she owned wax dummies in which she kept the cremated remains of former lovers. That would have meant a whole lot of ashes. She elevated hedonism to the level of poetry, putting the cadence into decadence, the verse into perverse. She was death-tinged, doom-fringed. Cadaverous is the adjective most often used to describe her appearance. In Paris, she was known as the Venus of Père Lachaise. She wore necklaces of live snakes. She wanted to be a living work of art. She died of a stroke in the summer of 1957 at the age of 76 and was buried with a pair of false eyelashes and a taxidermied Pekingese. Among the mourners arriving from Venice was her personal gondolier. 
incredible. I wish I'd known her. <laughs> so those are all amazing stories, mm. but I think probably what gives the book its depth is that it's not... It's, it's as much about the people who mourn the dead yep. and who tend the dead as it is about the dead themselves, isn't it? And I think there's a particularly moving passage where you meet a man called Mehdi Mera, mm. and he t- tells you about the the and you and you and you see obviously the tomb that he's created for his eleven year old son. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like talking to him about his loss? Sure. So what happened there was um, this was Kensal Green Cemetery, which is which was the first of London's big garden cemeteries, and I um, went in there for the first time, uh, not really quite knowing what to expect. And one thing that I saw while I was there that I didn't know was there, because because it's a cemetery that's absolutely full of huge Victorian mausolea and tombs that are kind of still very grand and crumbling. They're, they're, they're demonstrations of Victorian wealth and status and religious feeling and the depth of their grief, but they're very old. But when I was there, I was amazed to see a mausoleum a bit like those, but clearly almost brand new. And I, I didn't really know what it was. It was, it was kind of um, open to the elements. It had a kind of crown of steel girders and a gazebo within it. And it, was, it had lots of flowers. And there was a, there was a, a, a sort of life-size statue of a little boy wearing a suit on a bench there. And I, I, I tried to find out what this was I was looking at. And I, I discovered that it was the mausoleum, the grave, really, of a, a boy, an 11-year-old boy um, called Mehdi Mira, who had died in a riding accident a few years before. And so I got in touch with his family, um, and his father um, agreed to uh, meet me at the mausoleum. So we sat within the mausoleum, and we talked about, the, about his, uh, we talked about, first of all, about his boy and what an incredible person his boy had been. And then I asked him about building this thing, and it had been... He said that he wasn't an obsessive person, but he felt like it was something he had to do. He had to, in some way, this was the way he felt he had to uh, remember his child. Um, So he designed this thing himself, um, and he arranged for it to be built, and he was very hands-on during the building. He was there every day. And he still goes and sits there a lot and speaks to people as they come by. And it, it was just extraordinary to me to think that the sort of impulse that was driving... Uh, the Victorians to create those grand monuments still has its place within British society at a time when most of us cremate and the idea of that sort of remembrance has kind of fallen out of favour and it was certainly um, a a, a privilege uh, to be able to sit and listen to Mr Mera uh, talk about his son. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I mean obviously the Victorians did build these mausoleums but do you think in a secular age there's almost a tend and it's become more important to people to stamp their own personal um, like idiosyncrasies or personalities on their graves I think probably yeah I mean the Victorians were building these things and they tended to be drawing from a particular palette of design so you would get kind of tombs that looked like um, they were they, they were, had Greek influence, or they had ancient Egyptian influence, and, and and that sort of thing, or they had they were they were, or they were kind of clearly Christian, and I think as we kind of move past, um, as we move into a more secular age, you do you do begin to see, um, things that, that are just drawn from completely other kind of palettes. So so the Medi Mera um, mausoleum, for instance, has angels on it, but it also has, um, Islamic symbols. Um, but also in Kensal Green, I remember seeing a much smaller um, gravestone. Which was, which looked like a, it was made of um, granite, I think, and it looked like a fruit barrel. So it must have been. I think it was. It was the the a market trader, um, had had this made made for them by their children or whatever, and and you do see that sort of thing. So yeah, I think I think people do want to try as much as they can. And it's difficult in moments of your deepest grief to express something about the person that they've, they've loved and lost. Mm-hmm. But some people actually design their own, don't they? If they find out they're terminally ill. They'll... They'll, they'll want some control, I don't know, of, of, of what it's going to look like. It does you know? happen, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was in um, Highgate Cemetery um, f- quite a bit during the writing of this book. And in Highgate Cemetery, um, there's, a, there's an, a resident stonemason, a, a gentleman called Neil Loxton, who's a real artist, I think. He thinks of himself as a craftsman, I think. But I think if you talk to him, he speaks like an artist. And he... Um, Works very closely with families about how to um, 
uh, represent the person that is gone. He wants the stone to be almost um, a, a portrait of the person that says something about who they were, their character, you know? Um, so he worked with uh, the artist Patrick Caulfield, um, contemporary artist Patrick Caulfield, who designed his own stone, and I think um, Neil Hoxton then sort of adapted that slightly, and it just, it's, it's, made, of, it's made of granite, I think, and it's quite, it's quite large, sort of the, the size of, a, the size of a, a, a man standing up, and it just says, it's, it's got the words, the letters D-E-A-D, -E punched through it in sort of steps, so it says dead. So it's the most kind of blunt... Brutal. Exactly. It's, it's kind of brutalist in style and brutal in sentiment. So it's, 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 it's both serious and funny, you know. Mm -hmm. It's blackly comic. I think it's very... You know, as someone that lives in Glasgow, I kind of recognise the humour there, I think. Definitely. It's that kind of shipyard humour. Um, but also in that cemetery, there's a, there's a, a gravestone for a, a little boy that died called Sonny Anderson that Neil Loxton also designed uh, with the family... And what they had done was they had left the corner of the stone broken off and they finished it off with actual Lego bricks that had been owned by the little boy mm -hmm. and, and they were kind of glued into place. And then the family go there and they change the little minifigures on top. So at Christmas it's like a Santa and stuff like that. Or, and then they might go after Christmas and make it Star Wars figures and so on. So it kind of changes with the seasons. So again, it's just a way of remembering the person you've lost in the appropriate way, whether that's with an art statement or with the, the toys that they loved. Mm -hmm. So touching. But we do also live in an era where the environment's really important. So you, so some people don't want big monuments, do they? They want things to be as natural and to leave as little um, uh, impact on the earth as possible. Did you find out much about natural burial yeah. places? Yeah. I mean, it was important for me to try to reflect that, I think, because that is a, an area that is definitely growing in terms of how people want to be buried. So across Britain, mm -hmm. there's, there's these, uh, they're called natural burial grounds or woodland burial grounds. And generally the idea with those is you aren't actually buried in a coffin. Um, they bury you um, in, in, a, in, a, in a shroud usually or in, a, in a, a wicker coffin, something that could, or a cardboard coffin, something that's going to be easily biodegradable so that you more quickly return to the earth and kind of nurture the earth. And generally speaking, there isn't a, a, a headstone on their graves or it's sometimes um, a little flat uh, slate stone that's just on the level of the ground. So you're not... It, it feels like it's a it's an environmental gesture, but it's also a very modest thing to do. You're not making a statement about, about who you were. Or you're not trying to elevate yourself above the earth in any sense. You're trying to say, I was always part of this planet, and I, and I still am. Mm -hmm. And so I went to... Um, uh, Sharper Meadow uh, burial ground in uh, near, near Totnes in Devon, and uh, which is a, a, a burial ground on a on a hillside, um, looking with a kind of long view over the River Dart, and there's um, I think maybe about 150 people buried there at the moment. Um, they're buried on the hillside, and there's a kind of mound of earth put above them, and then and grass grows on that. So what, as you look at it, it just looks like a series of kind of grassy mounds. It's 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 very peaceful. Um, and it's apparently very beautiful in summer. There's a lot of wildflowers. But I was there. I went there um, for All Souls Day, uh, just after Halloween, because um, that's obviously a day... The idea within kind of Christian theology is that the dead and the living are very close at that moment. They're only a kind of... A, their hands are almost touching through the veil, if you like. Um, and I wanted to kind of go there and participate in... Um, a ritual which was supposed to be happening um, on All Souls Day where they have a, a bonfire um, and people go there and put these pine cones covered in some chemical that flares up so they, they remember their dead in that way. But it was the winter, there was high winds and it was it was cancelled. So I couldn't I couldn't go to that, um, which I, I felt was a disaster at the time because I could see that as being like a really dramatic moment in the book. But then you met Bridget. Yeah. Um, I, I, I had made contact already with someone whose husband was buried there and she didn't live too far away and so she agreed uh, to meet me there on that day anyway so rather than it being something some kind of dramatic ritual done at night with lots of people there with, around the bonfire it was just the two of us at the top of the hill um, in a storm and there's a little shelter 
um, a sort of made of earth and stuff up there. So you can kind of get in out the worst of the weather, but there's no, it's not glazed or anything, so you're still open to it. And so that was where she had had... That's where her husband was buried. Her husband was called Wayne, she's called Bridget. And we went to see his grave, first of all, and then we went back into the shelter. And she talked me through their life together, um, which had been a happy life. Um, they had a couple of children, they loved each other very deeply. Um, and then his uh, d depression uh, got the better of him, and uh, he took his own life. And Bridget decided that this was the appropriate place for him to be buried, in a wild place like this. So she talked me through the, the kind of ritual of that day, what they had done, where his coffin had stood within the shelter, the kind of felt throw um, with, with embroidered crows on it, um, which uh, they, they placed on there because they felt it was symbolic of him. Crows is the name of the, the chapter that, in which I write about this. And talked about how they had taken that coffin and laid it, and they'd taken, they'd taken him with the felt covering over him, he didn't have a coffin, sorry, and laid him within the grave in a shroud, and then she had buried him with her bare hands. And she sat with her kind of feet in the grave and had a smoke, and then carried on and she buried him. And it was absolutely the privilege of my life to listen to her tell me that story, to sit there and listen to it, and then to try to, uh, you know, a couple of months later, when I came to write it, to try to kind of convey to people what that felt like to be there. And it's, I, I mean, I've, I'm a journalist, so I've covered a lot of difficult stories and spoke to people about a lot of things and the, the, the hard moments in their lives. But I found trying to listen back to that and hearing her talk and hearing the howl and wind in my ears and then trying to sort of write down the put across what she was saying, I found that really moving mm -hmm. to the point where I was actually um, trembling after I'd written it. And, it. and it's one of those rare occasions where you're, you feel the words are kind of coming out of your fingers onto the keyboard and onto the screen before they've actually registered in your conscious mind. It's a very kind of self-actualizing moment. Um, so it was, it's, it's probably the best thing I've ever written. And it was certainly one of the, the greatest experiences in my life to hear Bridget tell that story. It's such a powerful, visceral moment in the book um, and probably made you think differently about what you were writing in general, did it? Was that a kind of turning point for you? It was. I mean, not so much at the time. It was only when I came to actually write it that I realised, because I, I, had, I had known all along that this, this book about death was going to be a book about life. It was going to be full of living people telling me their experiences and stories. Um, and it took that storm on All Souls Day and meeting Bridget to make me realise that actually what I was writing was a book about love. Love is absolutely the, the central theme of this book. It runs all the way through it, not just in that story. And I, th and I hope, and people, have, people tell me that they don't find it a bleak book to read. And I think and hope that it's probably because love is at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that's really true. Um, but we've talked a lot about people who can choose the way that they are buried, but unfortunately there are people who don't get to choose yeah. um, and, and don't get the burials that they deserve or that they want. So I was wondering if we could talk a bit about, as you know, it's my favourite chapter, Unmarked, which is about the outcast dead, isn't it? And uh, it begins in Crossbones. Yeah. For a bit of context, that's, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where the um, medieval, it's the resting place of medieval sex workers, isn't it, who were uh, licensed by the church, but then felt un found unworthy of being buried in consecrated ground, is that right? And that yeah. makes me really angry every time I think about it. Does it make you angry? Yeah. I mean, this is this is in the South Bank of London. So it's just it's just kind of Southwark, Bankside, that, that kind of area. Um, these women were, um, they were, as you say, they were licensed by the Bishop of Winchester. Now, I don't know whether that means that they were granted the authority to work or whether there was any kind of financial kickback to the church. But in any case, the church certainly um, allowed them to be uh, sex workers in that area of London, um, which is out with the city of London at that time. So it was a kind of red light district, kind of anything goes kind of area of London. But when those women died, they, as you say, they weren't allowed to be buried within consecrated ground because of the way they had lived their lives and neither were their children. And um, lately, um, 
the, the Church of England, or rather Southwark Cathedral within the Church of England, have decided that they've got something to apologise for there. So every um, year, every summer, on the Feast of Mary Magdalene, uh, Southwark Cathedral uh, processes out, with, led by the Dean of, of Southwark, um, and, and the, the clergy and all their kind of finery, processes through the streets of Southwark to the Crossbones graveyard and, and says sorry uh, for those women, to, to those women. Um, which is a very moving thing, and I think, I think, a, I think a, a just act, really. Um, but the Crossbones graveyard is, um, it, 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 in the medieval period, in the Elizabethan period, it was, it was, it was the resting place for those sex workers. But then um, later on in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was more generalised um, burial ground for the poor of the area. And you wouldn't know it now if you walked around Southwark, but at that time, Southwark was really, really poor. It was one of the, the, the poorest areas of London. You know, it, um, so people that couldn't afford to be buried in, in kind of grander places would be buried in unmarked graves in, in crossbones. And then it was kind of rediscovered in the 1990s when they, they built an extension to the Jubilee Line. They, they did sort of archaeology there and they found all these bodies. They think there's 15,000 people buried in quite a small space. So you can imagine they're, they're kind of crammed in. And these were people with, you can see from their bones, they had dietary deficiencies, they had rickets, they had other diseases, the, ch the coffins were cheap. Um, so it's, it's traditionally been not, the pl not a great place to be buried, um, but it's, it's become this sort of uh, gathering point for anyone that feels themselves to be an outcast or a misfit or a freak and who kind of owns those terms, if you like. So I know people, people kind of go there and remember people um, that they've lost um, in, you know, to, to kind of suicide or they've been maybe murdered. Or, or they feel they can't go and remember them in a church or in a kind of regular graveyard, but they can go there to remember them. And they have um, every month a kind of a, a, a ritual there, a vigil, um, to sort of celebrate outcasts of all kinds. Mm -hmm. So there's the incredible John Crow, isn't there? And um, I was wondering if you could read a little bit because that would be a good way to get the sense of just how kind of wild and <laughs> yeah th those vigils are. Absolutely. So John Crow is um, he is the person who more than anyone else has been responsible for for making Crossbones this this kind of place for celebrating um, outcasts. And it's an incredible space. You really must see it. It's it's this weird post-apocalyptic kind of garden space. Um, and he is, he's called John Constable, but he, he's got this sort of pen name, uh, John Crow, and he's a, he's a fascinating character. So I'll just read a wee bit about, about him and about his final vigil at Crossbones, because he was, he, was, he was giving up leading them at this point. So this, this took place last year. Welcome to Crossbones, said John Crow. Four months had passed since the Feast of Mary Magdalene. It was November the 23rd of November. That detail is important. Crossbones vigils are always held on the 23rd of the month, and this was the 23rd anniversary of the night when the writer John Constable had a vision of what he calls the goose, part Mary Magdalene, part medieval prostitute, part muse, who dictated to him a long verse poem called the Southwark Mysteries. He was back then in a kind of trance having taken the biggest dose of LSD he had ever risked before or since. But it wasn't a hedonistic act. He had been seeking revelation and found himself wandering the streets of Southwark in the small hours, visiting its ancient sites, the ruins of Winchester Palace, the cathedral and so on, before fetching up at the heavy gate to what, at that time, was a patch of waste ground covered in rubbish. The name Crossbones came to him in his vision, he says, and it was only later that he realised that this was the historic site of the graveyard. In that moment, he sensed that there was something special here. It seemed a sacred place that ought to be reclaimed. Now, that reclamation has been the great work of his life. In 2000, the year 2000, the Southwark Mysteries was performed at the Globe Theatre and at the Cathedral. It's quite a challenging piece, let us say, the dean had told me. We had never had a devil with a huge phallus walking into the cathedral before. That caused a few eyebrows to be raised. More important, perhaps, than that acceptance by the religious and arts establishment is the way in which the graveyard itself has become the focus of ceremony. 
Beginning in 1998, each Halloween has been marked by a so-called vigil at Crossbones, and from the 23rd of June 2004, these became monthly. Led by, John, led by Constable in his John Crow urban magician persona, these have a curious ambience, part utterly sincere magical rite, part playful bohemian happening, part performance art knees up. David Bowie, in death, was named Angel of the Outcast at a vigil. This was appropriate, as his misfit grace, his blurring of gender and sexuality, is very crossbones, but it also gave everyone the chance of a jolly good sing-along to Starman. Constable, though, was now 67 and had not of late been in good health, and he felt that his particular vision of crossbones is what he calls a magical work, and it was time to bring it to a close. This, then, would be his final vigil, which was why, at 7pm, around 300 of us were standing on the gate, standing on the street outside the graveyard. The long, tall metal gate was locked. It was covered in beads and photos and dolls and shoes and flowers, but mostly in ribbons and on which were written the names of the departed. It was a barrier, a threshold, the living on one side, the dead on the other. One day, of course we would all be on the other side of such a gate. For now, we looked in and wondered. The air smelled of incense and gin and a little dope. The shard gleamed hard and bright in the London night. I wondered what the people up there would make of us down here, and for that matter, what the skeletons below our feet would make of us up here, flesh-clad and expectant. Spirits of the dead, spirits of the living, kindred, said John Crow. Welcome to this, the 186th Crossbones Vigil. He was wearing a black velvet coat and a broad smile. We come here to remember the outcast dead, to remember our own lost loved ones, and to remember the living, all the outcasts, the street people, those with drug and alcohol issues, the sex workers, whether they are the victims of exploitation or, chose, or choose what they do freely. We honour all of these people from the edges of society. What followed was extraordinary. Poetry, music, readings from the Southwark Mysteries, Morris dancers in top hats, face paint and black and purple coats roared and strutted and clashed staffs to the sound of pipes and drums. The folk punk musician Frank Turner performed The Graveyard of the Outcast Dead, a song inspired by this place. Raga Woods, an environmental activist in her late 70s, wearing a headdress of scars, scarves and ivy, called out, We're connecting with the people whose bones were unearthed and who led us to be in this place. Hallelujah! Jules Allen, a mild-looking chap with a taste for serendipity, riffed on the significance of the number, so important to crossbones. Uh, the number of years that Yorick's skull lay buried before it was discovered by Hamlet, he asked the crowd. Twenty-three, came the reply. The number of hundred thousand stones in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Twenty-three. The height and feet that the tidal Thames rises and falls in central London every twelve hours. Twenty-three. And so on. To be in the midst of this felt at times like participating in some sort of benign hippie death cult. It was fun, but never frivolous. At a previous vigil, someone had read out their sister's suicide note, and that was as much in keeping with the spirit of crossbones as the songs and laughter and chanting. This is a place of healing and tolerance, where the poor were once dumped is now rich with meaning. And it feels important, in the midst of London wealth, that there should be such experiences that money can't buy. That's brilliant. And there's a lovely bit, I think, where you quote John Crow as saying it's about seeing the beauty and brokenness. Isn't there? And, um, it's occurred to me that quite a lot of the cemeteries that you cover are quite broken places, um, particularly Cathcart, but several other ones as well. Do you think um, that's part of the appeal for people who roam in them? The way they look? The brokenness, the kind of... I think, sense of ruin. I think so. I think. I think certainly aesthetically it is. I think you know the British uh, going back. Um, you know, 
to the Victorians, uh, uh, to the Romantics, I should say, have had a, a taste for ruins, you know, Tintern Abbey and all that, you know. And, and I think that's, that's still within us. Um, and as you wander through these places, I think an, an angel that's a bit broken with, with ivy growing up her is more attractive than a pristine angel somehow. Um, and more identifiable, you know, if you've, if you've lived a bit. Um, and, and, and also very Instagrammable. You know, I think that's part of the appeal of cemeteries. One of the reasons why tombstone tourism has become a thing, I think, is because we're all carrying around a, a computer library in our back pockets. So you can, you can see a name on a stone and you can whip out your phone and you can look that person up, mm -hmm. as I did with Mark Sheridan, and you can begin to find out something about their lives. So that, that moment of wondering about them and the moment of finding out about them is, 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 much, is much closer together. Mm -hmm. And also you can take pictures of these things, of these kind of ivy-covered angels, and put them on Instagram or put them on Twitter or wherever you wish to, and other people can kind of admire them too. So you can kind of share your wonder at these places now in a way that, that might not have been possible in quite the same way um, in, in previous times. But do you think there's something psychological going on beyond that that makes graveyards particularly appealing to people perhaps right now? I think so. I mean, certainly I, I, I found... I mean, I, I'm in Cuthcart Cemetery a lot anyway. I used to walk my um, youngest boy to school through there in the morning. But, but during the period of, of, of lockdown, when it was at its most intense, and maybe again, you know, and when you could only really go out and exercise once a day, um, that's where myself and my family would go. We would go... And, and walk within um, Cathcart Cemetery. And I found that there was more people than usual in there. And I think partly that was because the parks, the public parks were very busy. So it was difficult to kind of socially distance within a public park. Much easier to get your own space within um, an old cemetery. But also I think there is, as you suggest, something deeper kind of psychologically and emotionally. You know, you are surrounded by the dead and you think that might be a bit on the nose at a time of a global pandemic. But in fact, I think it's quite comforting. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's people in there that would have died of the Spanish flu. There's people there that have gone through um, depressions, whether they be economic depressions or personal depressions, moments of, of kind of national crises and challenge. And I think there's a sense of solace to be had in a graveyard. Um, I, I, you know... I think of it as, as uh, in terms of vaccination. You, know, you expose yourself to a particle of that darkness and therefore you do not yourself sicken with it. But also a feeling of community with the dead, a feeling of neighbourliness. You know, I think a feeling that they've been through this. They are us and they've been through it. And so you almost feel that arm around your shoulder and a, an encouraging word in your ear. So I think, I think probably that's going on, perhaps unconsciously mm -hmm. for most people too. I think that's absolutely true. I know so many people who have been walking in graveyards during the lockdown. Um, but in non-pandemic times, I mean, people are quite often looking for the big draws, aren't they? Who are the biggest draws? Whose tombs are the biggest draws? Well, I think you have to think about, um, about Highgate Cemetery there, certainly. Um, Highgate Cemetery is the last resting place of a ridiculous number of famous people. Um, and, and the most famous person to be buried at, at Highgate Cemetery is Karl Marx. Um, so when Karl Marx was buried at Highgate, he hadn't yet become Karl Marx, in inverted commas. Um, so he was buried in quite a humble grave, and then later he was, he was exhumed and buried somewhere much closer to the main path with a kind of huge tomb with, his, with his kind of a bust of his head on it. And he is the main draw for, for people going to Highgate Cemetery. I think particularly since the Chinese tourism boom, um, they found a lot of kind of um, tourists. Apparently Chinese tourists will, will kind of get off the coach at Highgate and they'll go in and look at Marx and then they'll come back out again back in the bus. They're not interested in the many other people um, in, that, in that place, um, of which there are many, like George Eliot is buried um, in Highgate Cemetery. People bring their pens to George Eliot, don't they? Yeah, it? that's become... Uh, I've, I've noticed that at a few graves in Highgate, but certainly people do go and stick their stick their bicks in the in the earth. <laughs> uh, other pens are available, I think. Um, they go and stick them into the into the into the ground there. I guess that's a sort of um, 
tribute to Giorgio. How many of those people that are sticking their pens from the earth have kind of fought their way through Middlemarch? I, I, I don't know, but certainly she's one of the people that is most honoured there. Malcolm McLaren, the Sex Pistols manager, people go and leave um, safety pins for, for Punk on, on his grave. So, mm-hmm. yeah, those, those are the kind of big draws of Highgate. And, of course, they're all in the... In the Highgate's split between the eastern and western part. And those people are all buried in the eastern part in which you can kind of wander more freely. You pay your... Whatever the entrance fee is now, it was £4 now, went. You pay your £4 and you can wander around and look at those graves and pay homage to those people. The western part you can only access by a guided tour and it's a little bit more exclusive. It's, it's where the, the best architecture is. Um, but, you know, you still get famous people buried there and, and so they have to be careful about maintaining some privacy around those graves. So, most famously, the other famous George at Highgate Cemetery is, is George Michael. George Eliot on one side, George Michael on the other. And because it's not so long since George Michael has passed um, and he still has family that visit that grave, he's not on the tourist trail. You know, they don't encourage people to go and look at that grave. Um, people do, very naughty People go and like go off the path and go look at it, but I guess one day the George Michael grave will become part of the kind of heritage of Highgate. But at the moment, it's still got that kind of intensity of personal grief around it. Yeah, unfortunately, time's going much too quickly, and there's a million other things I want to ask you. But can I just ask about to just to go yeah. on from that a little bit? Is there a danger about commodifying graveyards? Then I mean, do you have to strike a balance between um, private and pleasure, and and how much you're marketing it? I suppose. Well, I think so. I think I think the, the, the kind of cemeteries, the bigger Victorian cemeteries, do think about that really carefully. They think about, especially when people are still being buried in them. You know, if people are still being buried in them, then they have to strike a balance between people that go there to mourn and people that go there to visit, you know. Um, and so, you know, that's something that Highgate have to think about really carefully all the time in, in terms of George Michael, but also, you know, Lucian Freud... Beryl Brainbridge, people that have been buried there more recently, they have to try and think about that stuff really carefully, that they don't create modern day shrines when th- those people's families just want to go there and remember them as people rather than stars. Mm-hmm. Um, but also more generally, um, I think graveyards have to think very carefully about how they generate money. I mean, these places cost an awful lot to maintain, you know, um, and councils do not have the money if they're council owned, they, as, as a lot of them are, they don't have the money to spend on maintaining mm-hmm. them and making sure that you don't go beyond the point where the, the angel is aesthetically interesting to actively dangerous and falling over. Mm-hmm. And so places manage that in different ways. The, the, the cemetery, I think, in Britain that's, that's most um, accomplished at doing that is Arnos Vale Cemetery in Bristol, which I think is, is probably the, the grandest, prettiest Victorian cemetery outside of London, um, and they um, that's a that's a cemetery that at one time came very close to closing down, and because they just couldn't afford to stay open any longer, um, but now they found a way to monetize it. I think they have a they have a, a gift shop there and a, and a cafe and they have film screenings and uh, they have theatre productions and tours and all that sort of thing. You can still be buried there, um, but but they do also have weddings. Mm-hmm. I'll ask about the wedding if we get time, but I just want to... Uh, two people have asked the same question, and I just yeah. want to be able to give them a chance to, to, to have their um, voices heard. Um, Emma and Janice from Inverness have asked, basically, having now witnessed a huge variety of inscriptions, grave, gravestones, and ways of remembering you, or, or dead, have you considered what you might like for yourself when the time comes? Thank you, people at home, for asking me, <laughs> for asking me about my death. <laughs> Um, I think, um, I mean, I've, I, I have seen a lot of things. Um, the, the, the kind of narcissist in me quite likes the idea of the, the, the grand Victorian-style tomb with the weeping angels and, and, and all that, you know, um, the whole bit. But the, the kind of the hippie in me is quite drawn to the idea of the natural burial, the kind of desolate hillside, the shroud, you know, the, 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 the wind scouring the grass over your grave and nobody feeling obliged to come and visit. And the, the kind of, there's an appealing kind of loneliness about that. So I think it probably depends um, as the end of my life grows near um, uh, whether the um, egomaniac 
or the eco warrior kind of wins out. Um, I think what I'm saying is I'll decide closer to the time. Well, hopefully, 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 you'll, hopefully you'll have a plenty, with, with plenty of time touch, to, touch, to, to muse on the on the issue. Touch wood. <laughs> uh, do you want to because it's a nice way to round off? Do you want to just tell us a little bit about the wedding at Ernest at Ernestville that you? Yeah. Did? So um, I I. I I decided that I wanted to finish the book um, with this. Um, I went to um, four funerals and a wedding in the course of writing this book. And um, the, the second last uh, chapter in the book is Crows, the one about natural burial and about Bridget. So it's really the, the kind of emotional climax of the book, if you like. The high, it's, 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 it's high tide in the book. And I wanted to have a feeling of an ebb tide for the final chapter and end it. Like any good Shakespeare play on a wedding, you know, on one of his comedies. Um, and so I was allowed to attend uh, the wedding of a, a couple called Sean and Liz um, at Arnos Vale in, in Bristol. And I went there on Halloween um, last year. Now, they get a lot of goths at Arnos Vale for their weddings, as you might imagine. People that have the rings brought forward by wolfhounds or by an owl or something like that, you know. But, but Sean and Liz um, are, are just a regular couple, a regular couple of Bristolians. But they were very, um, it was very good of them to allow me to come along and, and, and be there for their, for their big day. You know, that was very trusting of them. You know, people were, people were fantastically trusting all the way through this book. So yeah, so they allowed me to attend their wedding, which was an outdoor wedding. Liz was very worried about the weather. She'd been checking the weather like for the kind of past Halloween several years back. And they actually were lucky with the weather. They got a break in the rain. And so they had a lovely um, outdoor ceremony. And they were going to have the reception in one of the um, chapels, beautiful old chapel, actually above the old crematoria, which is, the, the ovens are still down there, which is incredible to think. Um, the, the, you know, I mean, guests can kind of go down and look at these. So they had their outdoor wedding, which was beautiful. And then they came down the hill past the gravestones. She was wearing white and green wellies. And he was looking great in a kind of tweed, blue tweed suit. Um, and they came down the hill, past the gravestones, towards the chapel. And they, they passed through a kind of honour guard of their friends and family who threw confetti over them. And it was actually biodegradable uh, confetti. It was rose petals, right? And I, I watched these rose petals as they kind of drifted past Liz's wellies and... Sean's brogues, um, onto the grave of a Victorian man and wife who had died, um, obviously, in the 19th century. And I just thought that, for me, was the perfect symbol, confetti in a graveyard. It, sh it shows that a, a, a kind of um, a, grave, a graveyard is not an inappropriate place to get married. Mm -hmm. Those people in the 19th century had had their life and their love together, and now it was Sean and Liz's turn. And it was really the circle of life and the circle of love, love wasn't it? And, and the mm -hmm. circle symbolised by the wedding ring. So that was a, it was, for me, a, a kind of wonderful, uh, joyous uh, moment. And, and it kind of brought the, the book full circle, if you like. Mm -hmm. What a lovely, upbeat note on which to finish. Thank you so much for coming, Peter. That Thank was really Danny. fascinating. Thanks, and Danny. it remains just for me to say, remember and buy the book, <laughs> which is absolutely brilliant. You will not regret it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>